All right, everyone. Hope you are all doing very, very well. Um, it's that time again, and I'm very honoured and pleased to introduce another phenomenal person who's a client and friend of Shift Success. Um, he has joined Shift Success, I believe, about two years ago. It might be a bit later than that, or might be a bit earlier. Um, he's took business by storm. He's doing amazingly well, and um, he's going to be sharing his story from uh, police officer to entrepreneur. He's going to be talking about his business, his ups and downs of those of the journey, and uh, hopefully he's going to be providing lots and lots of inspiration for you going forward. So, Darren, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing? Yeah, hi, Alex. Yeah, very good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. It's all right, cool. So, I always start off these podcasts by asking, you know, what was it like for you uh, growing up as a child, um, and where are you from, Darren? Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm from uh, Cambridgeshire. So I live literally in between Cambridge and Peterborough. Uh, in a sort of market town um I grew up there my my parents were very young when they had me definitely wasn't planned I wouldn't have thought my dad was 17 um but it's been a really good upbringing to be honest you know times were hard at times as you can probably imagine but generally speaking fantastic parents still together now and um yeah no it's it's, it's uh it's been good um and then I found myself sort of in the police mate so yeah amazing amazing stuff well we'll get on to that did you grow up as a do you have any siblings at all or yeah so I've, I've got one younger brother so he's he's about three and a half years younger than me he's cool. um yeah very different to me he's he's uh crazy to be quite honest he, <laughs> he likes cage fighting and ice hockey and stuff like that right and uh I, I was the good child and he was definitely the uh the devil child he, he was the rebel right 100 percent, mate yeah oh, yeah okay Cool. So uh, growing up, you know, was you one of those academic nerdy kids? Was you, you know, the kid, the cool, one of the cool kids? What, what was you like growing up as a child for school, et cetera? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> no, definitely not academic. Um, school never really worked for me. So where, where I went to school, um, it was very much like, um, uh, you know, sit down, we're going to write on a blackboard and you're going to copy it into your books and that's how you learn. And to be honest, that that just didn't work for me. So that was sort of secondary school didn't come out with anything major to be honest um sort of just just scraped through uh went to sixth form yeah so not academic um I, I loved my sport so I was you know I used to play football and stuff um I'd like to say I was really good at it but it's probably pretty average to be honest um and yeah yeah I had uh my parents at one point paid for some extra tutoring for reading writing I sort of used to write backwards which I think is a sort of sign of dyslexia but to, to be honest I don't know what happened to that because I seem to do okay now so yeah but definitely not academic mate I, I don't class myself as a uh, hugely intelligent person certainly academically yeah. um, and I, I even remember a teacher sort of writing me off to my parents one parents evening and saying uh, you know you, you'll never go to university and sort of I don't think she used these words but like not to aim low but to sort of aim for a trade or something like that you know it's a sort of like a backhanded um yeah it's something that stuck with me obviously yeah 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 so did you go to uni in the end or no okay cool okay and what was kind of your first job leaving college six on college blimey so um i had um had loads of jobs in a very short space of time so i won't bore you with them all they were literally like a month here and a month there so i went to work for this like small it company that just paid crap and expected the earth and left there went and did some agency work as like a postie for a week and stuff and really enjoyed that and then I found myself at the local water board so Anglian Water um, and, and I was there for yeah about five years they were they were a really good company to work for looked after their staff relatively well paid for a young lad shall we say and yeah just sort of found myself settling in there and sort of sort of into supervisory and on the path to sort of management I suppose yeah cool. cool okay and um how old was you at that point was you like 17 I'm guessing 18 no so but by this point I was because I didn't finish my education until I was about 18 okay. so I, I sort of did sixth form and then sort of probably spent about a year year and a half in in crappy jobs for like a month here a month there and then yeah so probably started there just before my 20th and then and then I was there until I joined the police at about 25. So literally your second job was the police. My second proper job was the police, yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So what um so you know you're working for the water board company and then obviously mm. you you look into the police. What attracted you to the police? So 
so I, I worked although I worked for the water board I worked in the office and uh it was it was a bit of a boring job to be honest and my um manager at the time was a special um he, I think he'd just stopped doing it but we were out on a Christmas do and as you do you, you know especially when you're young you have way too many to drink and I was just quite honest with him I was like I, f- I think work's really boring <laughs> Mm. not something you should say to your boss to be fair and um said to him like you know I just don't know what to do with life and this sort of stuff and um yeah and he said why don't you join a specials to give you something to sort of do and that and um I'd, I'd kind of like at school I'd always considered like actually being a police officer would be really good it's the sort of outdoorsy something I could probably get my teeth into something I'd enjoy um but I, I, for some reason, I just hadn't thought about it. So I thought, yeah, actually, I could join the police. And and because I'm on like the path into management where I am, mm. the specials was sort of just a good way of sort of dipping my toe in and, and seeing whether I liked it. Um, so, yeah, joined the specials whilst I was there. Did that for about six months. Um, went out for my first shift um, on Christmas, got attacked. Um, just a, an absolute crazy night and literally applied straight away. Loved it. Yeah. you got attacked and you applied <laughs> yeah 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 literally we, we call them state zeros but called the state zero like yeah. the adrenaline I've never known anything like it but you know I, I was in my early 20s at the time it, it was great fun it was just something I'd never experienced before you know the driving on blue lights and all the stuff that comes with it mm. uh, yeah so I thought god this beats sitting in the office for eight hours a day and doing nothing so uh, yeah yeah applied there and then mate and yeah and got through for sort of first time which is amazing because you're not going to believe this but I actually failed my first assessment center for the specials uh but absolutely aced it for the regulars so so I, I don't know how that works to be honest yeah yeah that is uh that is pretty crazy so uh what force is it are you by the way so um I originally applied for the Met mm-hmm. um I got through the assessment center for the Met and then the uh Met was saying are oh, you looking at about six month wait time um, so I, uh, I was a special in cams and I was on sort of specialing and I see that they were recruiting. So I transferred it over uh, and literally started about three weeks later. My boss, who, like I said, was a special, was fantastic. He was like, you can hand your notice in and if it all falls through, you can, we'll just get rid of it. But yeah, so literally I was, I was in cams and I've been in Cambridgeshire ever since. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Um, throughout your career, um, and in fact, how long has your career been in the police so far? So I've been I've been a police officer now for just over fourteen years. Fourteen years. What yeah. are some kind of been some highlights for you? You don't have to go into much detail, but you know what 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 do you enjoy about the job? Some aspects you enjoy about the job. I, I still quite, you know, I, I do still quite enjoy quite a lot about the job. Um, when I was young in service, I definitely used to enjoy the thrills. You know, the, the going out the the nighttime economy and the driving and, and stuff like that you I did the police support unit you know the, the riot stuff early on and um but I, I think when I look back at the things that I've enjoyed the most um and this almost sounds like an interview answer doesn't it but it is actually uh the right things it, you know it's the vulnerable victims um you know the, the really vulnerable domestic abuse victims I worked I don't want to go into too much detail, obviously, but mm. there was a victim that I dealt with uh, who had had a heart attack uh, a few weeks before, and she was beaten black and blue. She had a broken jaw, um, and she didn't support the the police action. And, and getting the conviction on that um, was a slog, um, but it was such a good feeling um, to be able to to you know to to get justice, um, and eventually bring her on board and you know work with victims. You know, that's one of them that there's so many, you know, I, I do find victim based crime. Um, uh, I, I don't know if I'd say it's always rewarding because generally speaking, you feel like you're fighting a losing battle. Mm. But when you get that result, it's a fantastic feeling. Yeah. Um, awesome. I, I've I worked about half of my career on Intel as well. Um, and I've recently come out of Intel and I think I've realized um, coming out of there that actually working directly with victims is something I've actually missed more than I realized if that makes mm. sense mm. Yeah, yeah absolutely cool um so throughout 14 years um obviously you've got aspects about the job that you like what what's changed for you within those years and, and in fact when did it start to change for you where you start to go maybe a change in career is needed and obviously we'll talk about your business in a second but when did that start to happen for you and why 
So um, first, probably about 10 years was uh, was like flying, loved the job, um, could never see myself leaving, was in it till retirement. Um, and then sort of about a year or so after we had kids, I think at that point, sort of the pressures um, of having children and doing that job is, it, it, I suppose it just takes away the, the the fun factor a little bit, if that makes sense. You know, you've got 10 years in at that point as well. So that the novelty of it's sort of worn off by then. Um, and then, you know, working on Intel at the time as well, it's a very unsociable job. So then having our second child um, sort of four years ago now, he was a different ball game. He, you know, he was, he's, he was, he's hard at work, but, you know, love him to bits, but he's, um, yeah, you know, he's, 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 he was a lot to manage, certainly in his younger days. Um, and I think that's where the novelty started to wear off. And, and I applied for a couple of jobs sort of outside the police, you know, did what I imagine most people do think, well, I'm not happy here. So what am I going to do? Get onto LinkedIn, set up a profile, start looking and um, had a couple of interviews like, for, for some pretty decent jobs, to be fair. Um, what, what jobs? Yeah, so uh, I had an interview for a regional loss prevention manager job at DPD, the delivery company. Yep. Um, you know, fantastic package at the time. You know, bear in mind, we're going back probably about four, four years, four or five years ago now. Uh, it was 55 grand a year. It was company BMW every two years. It was um, free entry to Champneys, spas, and, you know, really nice little package. Um, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, got the interview for that. Um, they said, you know, loved it, but there was a, a better suited um, internal candidate, which, you know, is fair enough. Um, had another interview for a company called Blue Lights Digital, um, would have been rolling out the, uh, there's the, do you know, PND, the mm. Police National Database. Mm-hmm. Um, they're basically upgrading it. So it would have been working for this company alongside the home office to roll that out to every force. Um, I didn't get that, unsurprisingly, I think, because, you know, I'm just an officer I've never done any major projects or anything like that Mm -hmm. um yeah and just sort of got a bit frustrated I I think I did the thing that a lot of us probably do I I imagine and and sort of started looking at security jobs and loss Mm -hmm. prevention and it feels it just train train driver by any chance (laughs) yeah yeah train driver um but really you know what what I kind of always craved for I think was the better work-life balance that's ultimately what what started to take the shine away from the police for me if you like Mm, absolutely so so let's you know talk about that so you've obviously had two kids Mm -hmm. um what kind of impact that made for you in terms of working the job you know we hear all the time you know people can't make their daughter's dance lessons or their dance competition they can't make this their son's sports day or whatever you know what kind of impact that's made for you and kind of encouraged you to look elsewhere yeah so you know all those things have obviously you know they've affected all of us and I kind of expected that and I think my dad was a firefighter sort of a little bit later for me in life so he joined the fire service and I kind of always sort of experienced that a little bit with him um I think to be honest with you what really took the novelty of policing away from me and um this is you know I, I hate talking about this Uh, too much but when I was at Intel which is a really fast-paced unit it's the sort of unit where you you might start at 8 a.m um if you're lucky but you you don't know when you're going to be off you don't know what you're going to be doing you don't know where you're going to end up in the country it's it's one of those roles Mm -hmm. um unfortunately you know to get my my PDR the year before so sorry to run my PDR the year before was was exceptional so you know fantastic PDR really was enjoying the work the team was struggling a little bit with the kids and starting to think like oh I don't know if I can do this for the next 25 26 years whatever it was at the time yeah Uh, but but generally speaking quite happy um unfortunately my wife um very out of the blue had a seizure so I think you know about this Alex I think we've talked about this a few times yeah um so Fiona my wife she unexpectedly had a seizure and um we were decorating our bedroom at the time. We, I was wallpapering because um, I love love a little bit of DIY and stuff. Um, although if she hears that, she'll be saying, well, I've got a list, but I haven't done it yet. But <laughs> um, but yeah, I love a bit of DIY. So we, we were wallpapering the bedroom and, and she'd never had a history of seizures. She'd never had one in her life. You know, she's in her um, early 30s, I think, at this point, or around about 30 mark. And uh, just literally um, said to, that day, she said, oh, I keep having like this racing heart rate. And I said, I'll oh, book a doctor's appointment and left it at that. 
she started to paste in and she went very distant and she she basically had a full generalized seizure um gra- managed to grab her before she fell to the floor couldn't and do you know when you do your first aid they're like oh you know head, uh, head tilt chin lift whatever it is yeah. check for breathing yeah. nah couldn't couldn't hear a bloody thing I was like oh my god um you know I was on the phone to the yeah, paramedics as you can imagine and I'm literally hand over on her chest about to start chest compressions and luckily uh, she, there was a whimper and obviously she's breathing um really traumatic incident shall we say she didn't know who I was for six seven hours didn't know we had kids and it and wow. as bad as this sounds and and you know I'm conscious that you know I've just um that, that for a lot of people it is a lot worse um but the first thought is oh my god cancer or brain tumor or you you go straight from zero to to that worst case scenario yeah, yeah. um it was just epilepsy but that unfortunately coincided with um a lot of other stuff for us as a family so my um i don't want to go into my my um my my other family's sort of conditions because I'm I'm not sure how much they'd want me to talk about it but there was a lot going on we yeah. lost my granddad we lost my wife's gran within a couple of months of each other my granddad was terminally ill living with my parents at the time who were you know understandably struggling with, with everything going on with that but um you know and we live quite rurally so Fiona now can't drive got two young children and to be honest mate I was really stressed because um at the time we, we, there was no medication we didn't know what was wrong with my wife um and we've got like a, a, a and I think he was about 16 month old and a three-year-old and like I said when she has a seizure it's really violent she doesn't know who she is for about six hours seven hours she won't know who the kids are and I remember just going to work and just feeling like why am I, I, can't, I need to be at home I need to be at home like, I, I'm if she has a seizure now with the kids, what, what's going to happen? They don't know how to phone me. They don't know how to phone 909. And it, it was a stressful time trying to teach a four-year-old how to call for an ambulance and stuff, as you can imagine. Jesus, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, with everything else going on, I got signed off. I ended up getting this really nasty chest infection. And for the first time in my life, I went to see the doctor and said, oh, um, if can you give me anything to clear this? And she said, no, I'm going to sign you off. And I, I remember just thinking, I'm not asking for that. Like, what, Why? And uh, she said, you're stressed. And that's why I think you're not getting over this, this cough. So I got signed off. Um, I'd, I'd, um, I'd, I'd just signed up to shifts to success, actually, um, mm-hmm. at this point. Um, I'd literally just signed up, but hadn't started yet. So it, we'd had the day, if you remember. I'd met you, I'd met um, a couple of the other coaches, really impressed. And uh, I'd signed up, but I was due to start on on. Um, I can't remember what it was, a few months' time. Yeah. And, um, yeah, uh, and when I went back to work, I had my, had my, uh, went back after the month and COVID had now hit, we were in lockdown, and my boss was like, oh, come in, can we do your return to work and your PDR at the same time because it's now April? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's fine. And uh, and he said, um, right, we're not going to give you an exceptional this year. Um, he said, you know, you're really valuable member of the team. We're really pleased with what you're doing. He said, but you just, your head's not in it all of the time. And he said, I just want you to have a little think about why. And I just remember like looking, smiling and just not being able to say, well, why do you think? Bear in mind, this was now a weekend where I'm thinking, I hope my wife's not having a seizure. Um, and I just thought, do you know what? Like, I can't believe this. I've I've given 10, 11 years, like of literally every shift change, just taking it with a smile, doing exactly what they want, working as many hours as they need. And now I need that little bit back. And I almost I still feel bad saying this. Um, didn't get it. And that ultimately over the year, um they they supported me. Um because they let me take my toil to take my wife to her medical appointments. That's that's what they did to support me. Um, and uh, a year later, I basically, mate, I was doing a driving test like outside of work and just had a breakdown and just just got too much. Um, had a had about six weeks off and went back. I think we had a couple of phone calls, and by that point, the job then was done for me. Um, that was the point where I was like, I don't care what it takes. I need to, I definitely need to leave now. Um, I think the best thing I did was leaving that department um, that, you know, they still, I went in there the other day, they've got a sign on the door saying that they like to help everyone. And it, it almost um, made me angry. I, you know, I don't know if any of them are going to be listening to this now, but 
I personally just feel that the support I had there was just so crap. It just did me and I, I was just done. What I will say is that the constabulary as a whole are very good. Um, moving out of that department into this new department I'm in, we, we work with children, um, exploited children. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just been a whole new world. And it's it's sort of, I still want to leave, to be honest. That is still my goal, my ambition. Yeah, but yeah. I'm happy now. I'm working with victims again. I've got some fantastic management. I see a lot more senior management as well. I'm not in such a bubble. Um, and it's just a whole different world. So I feel very lucky. But at the same time, I think all officers that listen to this will know how quickly life can change. All it takes is a couple of moves um, and all of a sudden you're very unhappy again. So um, so t- to summarise, sort of my mission going forward now is to grow the business um, at the pace that we are um, so that, do you know what, if I'm not happy, I can just say, I'm off. see you later, there's my notice, I'm gone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So give, giving yourself a choice, right? Giving yourself that that opportunity. If that something does change again, you've got that alternative to go. You know what? My resignation's in. Um, cool. Okay. Um, just want to sort of unpack a few things. So, you know, you're not alone, and I know you know this. You're not alone with how sometimes a job um, doesn't support people in their time of need. And in your case, a family member needed you. Your kids needed you because their mother was, you know, found out she had epilepsy. Um, after 10 years of working in the job plus 10 years, um, and then you asking for the support and you not getting that, how did that make you feel on a personal level? Yeah, really upset. So, um, there's a few things that I'd say about that is that I think at the time I wasn't strong enough or I perhaps didn't even realize the support that I needed. I think, you know, for me, a good line manager would have said, Darren, you know, you're, this is what's going on at your home. How about we put you onto a flexible working pattern until your wife's medicated, until you know what's going on, mm. and you work the hours around your childcare because we, you know, we had the kids in full time childcare. Yeah, that yeah. never happened. We didn't, you know, and I don't think I had the mental capacity at the time to to recognise that's what I needed. Um, but also, and again, if anyone's listened to this and that, that you know they've suffered or or they're suffering mental health problems at, at the moment. Um, I am one of those people that's very bad and in, in admitting that I was having that problem. So what I will say about the organisation as a whole is that actually as police officers, what we do have is access to a lot of mental health support through various charities and organisations. Um, but we're very bad at reaching out for that because of the culture, I think, a lot of the time. Um so I think there's a little bit of personal responsibility for me, if I'm honest. Um, I think that the, the services were there. And actually, when when I had the right um, person come in, and it is actually still in my old unit, who's, who's and it was actually the Fed who said to me, why are you not accessing this then? And it's like, well, I didn't know about it. And, and um, you know, you have to reach out for support if, if you need it. Um, but when it comes to the job, I think it just, I think, it really upset me to think that I'd given all all those years and all that and and the support that I was entitled to was being allowed to take the time owed to me to take my wife who can't drive when we live rurally to medical appointments and and the medical appointments I'm talking about are like sleep deprived EEGs so you know it's not the sort of thing when you've not been able to sleep for a day and a half that you just want to jump on a bus and go to the hospital it's 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 not that straightforward. So yeah, I, I, I did feel really let down, to be honest, mate. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, I would have felt the same, exactly the same. And, and again, I hear this time and time again, a lot of police officers do feel the same as well. Um, it's like a bad relationship almost. It's like, you know, it's like I've, I've given everything to this relationship and then you just like get nothing back. And I, and I, and I completely understand that. Um, you just mentioned that you came to a point in your life or, or a point in your career in the police, should I say, where I think you said you was in the car and you had a breakdown. Talk to me about that day. So um, I'd done, <laughs> I'm going to feel really mean here. So basically my, my parents had bought a caravan and I, I'm just a bit too young to have that automatically on my driving license. <laughs> so I was doing a trailer course and the first day was like a bit of training that I'd paid for. So you drive around with this guy and and um, 
and do the reversing and stuff and it you know it all went absolutely fine but I knew I weren't right my family had been saying to me you need to go and see a doctor but I, I didn't want to get signed off it was one of those weird situations um and he just the guy he was lovely and I feel really bad saying this but he was ex-RSPCA and he just kept talking about policing all day well I've been on this job when these badges were being done you know and it was just like like I'm, I've, I've booked manual leave to do this course I just don't want to sit here talking about what wildlife jobs you've had with police officers i know it sounds really mean mm. um but yeah i come away and i thought right one more day i get the test done you know a few more hours driving around practicing a few bits uh, and then we're done and uh and, and he got out of the car when we got to the test and he's like you'll smash this don't worry about it you know i'll see you in, in an hour or so whatever it is yeah and uh got in the car the examiner come over introduced himself and he's like yeah you ready and i'm like yeah yeah i got in the car and the examiner walks up and uh, I start reversing and then just all of a sudden out of nowhere my leg just like violently starts shaking so I have to stop the car because obviously I don't want to go much further back with the reversing because I'm going to mess it up anyway I stop the car and then all of a sudden just more my other leg starts shaking and I'm not on about shaking they're like violently shaking mm. and I got out of the car because I'm like a bit confused as to what's going on and now my hands are shaking and the examiner bless him shouts over if you get out again you failed the test and I just said to him I, I need to stop and he's like what do you mean and I said I, I-, I can't and I was just yeah just it was uh I didn't feel I don't think it was a panic attack because I didn't feel it on my chest or anything I just I was just done um and I was just shaking, wouldn't stop for probably about five minutes. And then it, then it did calm down. And the guy came over, he's like, what happened? And I'm like, I, I can't do it. I said, I just can't do it. And he was like, oh, he didn't know what was going on. I said, look, I just want to go home. And yeah, and, and that's kind of what happened. And I had a chat with a doctor and the doctor's like, yep, you're basically, um, your bucket is too full, if you like. And that's, um, you, you've burnt out. And that's basically what happened yeah wow and you know you know what that's a symptom i've heard of before you know shaking um you mentioned that your parents and those around you noticed that darren's not himself kind of thing what would they say that changed in you would you say i think snappy so i did a lot of work with like um mental health services after that like you know obviously um did a bit got diagnosed with anxiety and depression and and they're, they're things that other people suffered with i never you know it's not in my genes never suffered of it yeah. um never thought I would um but I got diagnosed with them and one of the things that people around me noticed and I beat myself up a lot for was snapping at people so you know the, those that are closest around me uh, I would snap at them and and I think as you know with your parents and stuff you can you can kind of take that a little bit you don't want to be like that 100 but when you've got young children that's a massive problem mm-hmm. um so you know don't get me wrong it was nothing really bad but it was just like you know um it was just being short with people all of the time and just being a bit of a horrible person to live with i think mm-hmm. um yeah so yeah i think that's what bothered me the most as well that made me feel really guilty because although i was like that I knew I was being like that and that was really hard. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great stuff. Um, So at this point, you realise a change is needed because lack of support and also just the lack of control, I suppose, more than anything. You've got no control and things can change like that in the job. And of course, you you meet me, you, you, you join Shift Success and you start exploring the business world. And I can remember very clearly one of our first conversations <laughs> <laughs> about one of your first business ideas which was a hearing aid battery company was that correct yeah that's it yeah yeah and we kind of had a bit of chat about that kind of move that to the side and then we start exploring different ideas um do you want to explain to everyone what your now business is what the company name is and what you do yeah so um yeah so that's the very much gone that business but we i now own a business called motion to profit um so Yep. So basically, as per the name, Motion, we create video content um, mm-hmm. for business uh, to help them generate profit, I suppose, to help them make sales, uh, help them build relationships with potential customers. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so we, we are a video production agency. And as we all know, we suffered lockdown. Um, so during lockdown, we also started doing podcasting. Um, 
so yeah so i would i suppose that doesn't fit with our name at all to be fair but i would describe us as a video and podcast marketing agency something along those lines amazing amazing <laughs> um it's dynamic i love it yeah. um so why for those you know, i've seen the job um listen to this for those who are outside the job as well um they might be new to business and thinking why video and why podcast you know why is that important for business owners why start on off with a video and then of course into podcast yeah so um we're doing a podcast now right so we're, we're doing a video and a podcast yeah. um so there, there's so many reasons so um you, you have to build a relationship with your business so do you know what let's go back to the hearing aid battery business right i couldn't understand why i wouldn't sell it was a great little business idea you pay five pound a month like dollar shave club you pay yeah. five pound a month and you get your hearing aid batteries every month through the door so you haven't got to worry about forgetting them and not having access to your hearing aids but but we only sold uh a few packs to a few family members uh basically my nan <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, and it's because no one knew who we were no one could trust to give us money every month and understandably no one it you know it was almost like hi we're here buy buy our package and and everyone basically said no um so what we help business owners do is is to create high valuable uh content that engages with their target customers um uh, and builds trust essentially um so two fantastic ways of doing it are through video and through podcasts mm. um you know whether that's short form video i.e tiktok instagram reels um or you more longer form videos on say youtube uh, or whether it's a podcast it, it's a way of delivering value to your target customers and that's what we look to do so we essentially build assets for a business that will sit out there will engage with potential customers draw them in and ultimately then help them make that sale later down the line makes perfect sense for those who listen as well you know why is trust important what why is it important to build trust with the customers through video and uh, podcasts yeah i don't want to go into this too much right because obviously we, we have got all day um yeah so um you know i've learned this through you i feel like i'm being tested now alex uh, i've learned <laughs> through shifts and success right so yeah um there, there's some research out there if you're thinking about setting up a business you, you need to know about it it's called zero moments of truth and it's done by google so um i don't I won't go into this too much but there used to be different moments of truth and that was all about making a Saudi experience and that sort of stuff we basically live in a digital age now right so the last 10 15 years everyone has the internet on every phone pretty much nowadays unless you're a drug dealer or something you've with a burner phone but most phones nowadays have access freely to the internet so what that means is if we're gonna if we're gonna buy something that's more than say 10 15 20 pound we're going to do a bit of research and we're going to start stalking that business to see what the reviews are and what they're like and and actually at that point what we need to do is we build need to build no like and trust so um if someone's doing that research you want to be in their face a lot of the time delivering value to them so it's not about you and your business it's about helping them with their problems um and yeah and you you basically need to get over you know as many so the, the research says so many platforms uh so many touch points so many um engagements if you like so the the more content you put out there the podcast a website a facebook page it gives them more ability to stalk you more ability to build trust and then ultimately more ability to um to build that relationship and then it makes that easier selling subconsciously there you go yeah absolutely so basically in a nutshell what you're saying is the more content the more people engage with you the more likely people trust you and that trust is important to yeah. buy from you right 100 yeah and, and do you know what I, I find it really frustrating and this is this is where i was before i started shifts to success is that with the hearing aid battery business we shared a few articles on our social media which were from like bbc uh, about hearing aid batteries that we felt were relevant mm -hmm. but but we didn't talk about the, the real problems you know the, the you know the, the the running out of hearing aid batteries and and how that can affect you and and why that's wrong and how you know we should have um we should have created some really valuable content um and we didn't we just 
we just posted for posting sake. So we work with our clients now and we say, look, actually, we want to build assets. So, you know, we work with people on their YouTube channels where, for example, we work with a digital marketing company um, and we're building up a YouTube channel uh, for, for them, helping them build that. Um, and within those videos, we are teaching them how to do digital marketing because we know that by doing that, we will build trust with with the target market and that's more likely to bring them in. So by helping people, we actually make it easier subconsciously for them to come and buy our products. Love it. Absolutely love it. Makes perfect sense. So talking about uh, um, uh, your customer and, and their problems, what who is your typical customer and, and what kind of the common problems they have in terms of, you know, video and creating digital assets? Yeah, so so our, our customers generally, they're not small business. So we very quickly found out that very small business owners don't tend to have a lot of money to invest in video as, as you know, actually it's pretty common sense when you think about it. So we generally target businesses with at least £100,000 turnover. Um, and we have we work with pretty big international business now, hopefully. So I don't know if I can say it. Um, <laughs> But yeah, um, you know, so we, we work with a bigger business. Most of our clients are in the sort of training sector. Um, so yeah, but they're well-established business. So the good thing with sort of co- trainers and coaches like yourself is that you have to get content out there. You, you, you have to become known and you have to, to sort of conquer your niche. And you do that by being ruthless with your content and delivering value, value, value. Mm-hmm. And then it makes it easier to buy that buying decision. So a lot of our clients are coaches, essentially. Awesome. Awesome. So what kind of some of the problems you found like working with these people, like, I can, you know, I can imagine when I started creating content, it's like, well, what the hell do I say? Uh, what topics do I like cover? And, you know, the herms, right? And getting comfortable with speaking, you know, what, what are some common problems that you've found working with some of your clients? Yeah, be, being in front of a camera is a massive one. Um, you know, if, yeah, try it. <laughs> if, you, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, it doesn't sound that hard, try it and you'll see. But being in front of a camera is a big one. Um, actually, do you know what? My, my target customers, they're, biggest two problems like we we, ha- we know what all of their problems are to be honest following your process but that the biggest two problems are time and know-how so mm-hmm. you know most of our customers know the value of producing this content they, they will generally come to us to produce it for them they know the benefits and we don't actually need to sell it to be honest mm-hmm. um what they struggle with the most is they're business people they're busy and they are servicing their clients and and so so what we try and do is we try and have really intensive days of recording with them Mm -hmm. so um for i was just talking to a client about an hour before this this started and i'm saying to him right you know when we meet tomorrow i want to do four youtube videos in the morning and then i want to get out in the afternoon and probably do 20 30 shorts um, so, you know, in that day, we're looking to record between 25 and 35 videos. So it's a really intensive day for him. But what it means is that for the next 29 days of the month, he hasn't got to meet me again. I can just crack on with the editing. Mm. And so time is a massive issue. Uh, and then the uh, second is know how, you know, it is a bit technical. You have to be relatively good of a camera. Some people are, and we advise those clients because it's part of our missions and values. We, we try and advise people. You know, you, you've seen it in the community, mate. We, we I will openly help anyone on shifts to success, create right. their own content if they haven't got the finances to, to do it. Um, but, um, yeah, a lot of the time, the know-how is a problem as well. If you run a business that turns over, over 100, 200, 300K a year, you generally want some pretty decent-looking content to go out under your company name. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, so we'll go on to like what makes a good podcast and a, and a video in a, in a second. But um, for someone watching and, and not up to date with kind of best practices, where should a business owner be putting themselves? Because there's like there's Facebook, there's YouTube, there's TikTok now, there's Instagram Reels, there's Facebook Reels, there's YouTube Shorts. Where where people where should people put themselves in terms of video content? Um, I think that very much depends on the business. So you know. Um, I find uh, TikTok is really good at uh, views. You, If you put things on TikTok, you'll generally get more views than what you say we're on Reels organically. But I think in all honesty, we've only got so much time in the day. 
I think it all depends on your business. So a lot of our business to business clients are quite, um, you know, I'd, I'd still recommend things like LinkedIn and stuff like that. Facebook is still a massive, massive platform. Um, TikTok is up and coming. But, but will it be with us in a couple of years? Who knows? Uh, and then you've got YouTube Shorts, which is now um, the way YouTube seems to be pushing to try and take that TikTok market. In all honesty, mate, a lot of the clients that we work with, we actually produce content that can go over all of the platforms. So when it comes to video, I, I, you get two types of videos in my view. You get your 16 by 9 aspect ratio, which is your rectangular uh you know normal videos if you like which you'd watch on your tv and then you get your short form videos which is more like if you imagine you're recording on your phone and you've got it in portrait mode we tend to make our videos to go over both platforms mm -hmm. so by doing that for example if we were creating short form con in short form videos you could post that idea with, with the it's ideal for tiktok youtube shorts instagram reels and then if we were making you the other video to 16 by nine i'm sorry to go really technical here i don't want to bore people yeah. stop listening but yeah the, the other type you can then post on facebook youtube normal youtube and um linkedin so you know we we produce the vast uh, majority of our content is in those two aspect ratios which then makes it suitable for every platform right. um, and then it's just a case of posting it actually so if you've got it why not get out over every platform but primarily focus on what suits your business the most. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is that when you, when you shoot, and this is probably your approach that makes it different, you, you, you have a whole day of, of shooting yeah. and you'll get so much footage, but that footage can then be used for YouTube, Instagram reels. You can put it everywhere yeah. that business owners target customer is. Yeah. Right. So tomorrow, as an example, we will record four long video so they will be in the rectangular so they will go on facebook linkedin youtube um on, on those platforms and then we will create 20 to 30 short form content which is your very less than 60 seconds the idea of that is that that if they click through on that that will feed into a longer video where you can deliver more value so yeah so ideally i would say you know anyone can produce a video using their mobile phone very quickly and post it straight to tiktok you could do that every day. You, if you're a business owner and you're going to get into business, you could literally go live on TikTok on your phone with no effects and just deliver a bit of value to your target customer. Um, the problem is then once you've built a following there, how do you then get them on to a different platform to perhaps deliver some more value? Because there's only so much you can talk about in 60 seconds, right? Mm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, what makes a good video in your opinion? Like there's loads of like influencers out there. There's loads of YouTube content, TikToks there, as we said, what, in your opinion, what makes a good video? What is kind of like three must haves to make a solid video in your opinion? Um, I think the scripting is really important. So that it, I think, um, a video, a good video knows who it's talking to. So, um, you know, knowing your target market and, and, making your speaking to that select group of people makes it extremely engaging for those people it makes it more shareable to their friends and and people of the same mindset um yeah so i would say that the most important thing is that it's engaging um i think we get too hit up on it being professional all of the time i think actually mm. nowadays we accept the fact that a lot of videos will just be done on mobile phones and stuff certainly with things like tiktok and bits mm -hmm. um but if you're creating a promotional video for your business that's going to be on your website then it needs to be professional so i'd say professional with the right video is is definitely up there um and yeah i, I suppose the third thing that people really like is creative so we we mix a lot of funny clips into our youtube videos and bits like that to keep the attention so with with that i would say um professional content as a last third um that's that's relatively important depending on what sort of business you are but uh funny uh, and engaging and sends the right message uh, those are the three things i think are really important great so for the people watching and they find themselves like a you know not a funny person the videographer the or the the, the person who's editing the, the video they can add bits of humor in to make it more engaging right especially if you're talking about something very bland like i don't know paints as an example 
<laughs> you, you can you know you can edit things in that makes it more engaging and keeps your viewer viewing yeah 100 percent. yeah you have to you, you know edutainment they call it don't they and that that's massive at the moment we have such short attention spans and i am a nightmare for it when i'm flicking through on youtube i will get bored within 10 15 seconds mm. so actually when you've got something of value and you break it up with a little bit of comedy as well mm. it's fantastic and that's where a videographer or video editor will be able to advise you you know to to, to make a a what, what a good videographer do is help you make a bit of a bland subject a bit more interesting for people. Yeah. Um, but without making, you you know, you've also got to be careful. We live in 2023. I know you don't like woke, but you, you have to be mindful that you are the face of your business as well. So, you know, you want to do it in a, in, in a good way without offending too many people, ideally. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a, you know, fair, fair point. Um, would you, because because I've got like, you know, when I put out content, I talk about you know, people and, you know, people being snowflakes and stuff. And the way I would see it is that by putting content out there, it's saying to those people, we're never going to work together, but also it's going to attract those people who've got an affinity. So, you know, talk about um, whether you love him or like him, is not the point, but Andrew Tate, he's, he's got his own image and stuff, and he's obviously built this huge following. And there's lots of people who absolutely hate him. Okay. So he's got love and hate, but nonetheless, you know about him. So would you feel like there's some advantage with speaking your mind and not worrying about offending people? Or Yeah, I, th I think that's a, a decision for the business owner. And I think that very much depends on what market you're in. Um, so, yeah, you know, yeah. So, you know, as an example, it, it, we work, we've worked with um, some sort of maternity based yeah services so for example breastfeeding mm -hmm. there's two very sh strong sides of an opinion on breastfeeding now if you're a breastfeeding coach you you're gonna obviously uh put out content that doesn't care what the the middle-aged man walking into a restaurant and seeing someone breastfeeding thinks because why would you yeah. um but if you had a uh for example we're we're hopefully going to start working with a 50 million pound business soon that are global and and have a huge amount of interest in protecting their brand image then that's where we need to be a lot more careful so i think it very much depends on the business i think you're right you know for, for, for a company like shifts to success and this sounds um it sounds horrible but you know building a business is not easy it takes a lot of hard work yeah, yeah. if you're if you're half motivated and you can't be bothered and you just want to be the victim of life 100%. Uh, in the nicest possible way perhaps not for you but if if you're determined and you're going to pull your finger out and and make the change yourself then do that and actually i think saying that it is healthy because do you know what like i know i know what you're like alex you you, you know shift success as an investment right mm -hmm. you you want it to be the right people because i know that the vast majority of people within that um community um are successful and that's because it's the right people in there if you've got someone in there that doesn't want to put the work in then don't bother and that's where i think it is good to split split that split that opinion yeah. but it has to be calculated and you, you have to really think about it before you do yeah completely agree and it, and it is it is it's completely calculated you know you know I put, I put stuff out there on purpose to like these are these are our standards these are our values and you know people do message me and get twi tw twiggered and people unfollow me people love it of course and share it but you know there's the standard that you know i, I do want to work with people who are this type of person if you're not this type of person we're never going to work together um and also you know um the way i see it is if people get offended by people's content that's on them my, my job is not to tip tiptoe around life you know worrying about people which um I think a lot of influencers are waking up to now, which is, which is interesting. I think, um, I think it's really good as well, because actually, do you know what, but <laughs> it just sounds really bad, but by having those angry comments, you don't generally will spark um, conversation for want of a better word within the comments, which will just improve the algorithms anyway. So in terms of a marketing tactic, and this yeah. is why Andrew Tate, Pierce Morgan and, and people like that as a successful, even um, what's his name, Jeremy Clarkson, yeah. is because for everyone they upset, they will gain a follower. And those those heated debates that you get, and I, I hate it, I, like, I hate the way the world's going like that, but those heated debates that you'll get on social media that you would never have face to face, 
only increase the algorithms and only make them more and more popular because guess what if you if you get really really offended by what Pierce Morgan say and then you go onto Twitter and make a comment on every post he does about how despicable a human being he is then all you're doing is helping him because you're just engaging with his content which means Twitter's just going to keep showing it to you all the time I love that it's so true I think a lot of (laughs) trolls and haters don't realize that like when you you know and this is for those who are thinking about creating content as well like if you're fearful of getting haters and trolls and di- people disagreeing with you which you will have at some point um just realize that by every comment like what darren said they're helping you reach more people um you know it's i think if people kind of think about that from an advantage point of view of business then i think they'll be more comfortable with creating content uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and actually, when the algorithms work like that, if, if you think about it, because I, I notice this, I, I come off Twitter because I don't think it's healthy to go arguing about things that, that actually don't really affect my life that much. I haven't got time yeah, for yeah. that nowadays. But, but um, you know, when I was on there years ago, I used to go on and make a comment about something I disagreed with. And, and I noticed that, that Twitter would just put more of those people in front of me. So let's say, for example, I'm, I don't know, left leaning in my politics, it will just continue to put right leaning people in front of me because it knows that I will argue with them, which means I'm on their platform, which means they can advertise to me. And that's ultimately how Twitter makes money. Um, And it's the same across all social media. So yeah, you're just just doing exactly what they want you to do. (laughs) So so basically, it's like, they'll show you a bit of content, you engage, it might be a like, a share, a comment. And then basically what happens, it will show you more of that content, which confirms your beliefs even more. And then, you know, you'll start getting deeper, deeper down the rabbit hole where yeah. you know, you're surrounded by that belief. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's what's happening. You know, we, we've become, as a country, you'll probably see it politically that, that you get the far left, you get the far right. And, and, you, you know they, they, those two groups seem to be growing and i genuinely believe that is because social media will continue to reaffirm what they believe by just putting more and more content that they're going to engage with and it's not because social media want them to think like that it's yeah. just because they engage with it and whilst they're engaging with it every between every post will be an ad that they're being paid for yeah absolutely I, you know I'll, I'll hold my hands up i don't know if you know i i recently tiger woods played right and uh I think I think he's a legend for doing it, um, but I, you know people have been triggered by it. He uh, he outdrove one of his uh, competitors, Justin Thomas. They're very close friends. They have a lot of banter, lads, 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 right? Mm-hmm. And you know Tiger's like ten years older plus over him, and because he outdrove him, he handed Justin a tampon like under, you know, under the like. So it was covered. No one else was supposed to see. It was just a joke between two friends. Obviously, some journalists picked up on it, snapped a shot of the tampon. Basically, Tiger was saying, you know, you're, um, you're a woman, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, people got really offended about it. Um, and I, I found myself commenting on that post, that image of Tiger get handing the guy a tampon saying, you know, basically people love to feel offended because it makes them feel important. And um, it was a joke between two friends. I mean, you know, I had quite a few people liking my comment, but nonetheless, I find myself commenting on a piece of content that was, it knew I liked Tiger. It it was showing me that. um, And it showed me more after that as well. Um, So yeah, what you're saying is spot on. Yeah, yeah, it works well. Um, But on the flip side to that, it, that might have offended me say and if you're a business doing that you need to be careful because what you although it can work well if it's done well you, you can also lose potential clients over it so you know what what you don't want is for example the digital marketing agency that we work with they wouldn't want to be controversial like that because they know their current clients will be checking out their youtube mm. and they, they wouldn't want to lose clients over uh, maybe a, a, a poor joke so we're very careful putting the right content in that's funny but wouldn't necessarily offend anyone if that makes sense of course of course i suppose as well i mean where would i suppose i don't know if you've ever encountered this and i've always asked the question when something kind of challenges your beliefs do you pick the belief or do you pick the reward essentially you either gain a client or lose a client or actually firm your beliefs you know where, where's the where's the line do you think No, I think um yeah do you know what I think we all work with people sometimes that we might not necessarily I mean 
No, maybe we don't actually, not in business. I, I think in the police, we work with a lot of people that we obviously don't like um, <laughs> in terms of, you know, like, you know, the wrong people. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I don't know is the honest answer. Um, I think I, I'm very careful. When I, when I started in business, I was very much like sale, 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 and I need to work with ev- everyone I can. Uh, I quoted up um, some services the other day for a, a guy that I was just like, not really sure about this to be honest and um I felt like sort of obliged to quote him but I sort of thought to myself like I'm not going to enjoy this one as much as mm-hmm. what I do my other with my other clients because I really enjoy working with all of my clients at the moment I'm really lucky um so I just I just kind of thought you know what I'm not that bothered about this and, and stuck it in I'm very much learning I think one of the biggest things with business is that when, when you take on a client it has to be a good fit for both of you like it is so important like we've had estate agents that that want to work with us and the first thing they're doing is they're saying can you drop your price by 60 percent and at that point I'm, I'm just like I don't really want to work with you to be honest so no um you know look if you know if, if we're not the right fit for you go and find someone else and that estate agent actually did come back to us as well and said actually maybe we would consider your pricing because we've now realized this other company aren't that great it's a two-way thing when you get a client it has to be and you know like for example if I joined shifts to success like we were saying and I thought oh well, I can't really be asked to put in the work then it's not a two-way thing it's not going to work and all I'm going to do is sit there pay you and get annoyed that I'm paying you because it's not going to work yeah. if you put the effort in and make it work um then it's going to be a two-way thing that benefits both of us and that's kind of how I've seen this process to be honest mate is that like you know it was a big investment for me and my wife I'll be honest you know we 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 went away we had a really good think about it we discussed it we went out for dinner to talk about it after the day we had with you guys in Birmingham yeah um and it was you know it it was a a massive thing at the time it was like do we go on holiday this year or do we do this And, and it was those sorts of discussions but ultimately um funny funny enough actually uh but ultimately we decided do you know what if i want to change it i need to change it yeah? yeah um we didn't go on holiday that year we shined up the shifts to success uh it all went a bit crazy we're locked down um but what have we got now we've we've got a business that is growing every year um you know what we paid to shift to success if we had to pay that again now it'd be relatively easy to find that money out of the business to be honest does that make sense? Like absolutely. So if everyone watching, I mean, up when you joined, I think Darren, it was about three and a half thousand pounds, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And what you've gained now in business, you know, you don't have to do use specific numbers. You know, would you say you've, you know, five x that, three x that, seven x that? Um. So yeah. So we we um we we established the business in November, mm-hmm. and by um March we had two x that. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I'll say, and I'll say as well that that's not just shift success. I will say this: Darren is a fucking hard worker. Uh, Darren puts in the work. He's pivoted his ideas before. He gets himself out there. He has the doubts like everyone else, and um, he has a kind of a no excuse mentality. Which, you know, through my content I put out, that's the type of person I want to attract, and that's the type of person I want to work with. Um, you mentioned that you sacrificed um, holidays, um, which I think some good thing i think i i've done that as well when i started my first business um in your i've got my own theory about this but when your theory, why do you think most people can't forgo instant pleasure for long-term gain what's your opinion on that i think we 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 live in this like policing is a hard job and you need to break so when i say we sacrifice on those we went camping mate that you know i won't sacrifice too much on the kids because yeah with the kids love the kids um it's all about the kids so yeah so look we, we went camping do you know what right the kids don't give a crap at that age that they, they didn't care less they don't care. if we went they, they would have had a great time an all-inclusive in spain or whatever but but we went camping in the woods instead you know in, in a campsite a couple of miles from us we didn't have the flight to deal with we had a great time um so we've got the memories but in June, I haven't told anyone this yet, but in June, we're going on a cruise with the kids now, uh, on a PO cruise. Um, we're going to Nor- Norwegian Fords. We've just booked it. Um, I was had a sickness bug. <laughs> I was off work and I thought, you know what, fuck it, I'm I'm fed up. I need a holiday. Um, so yeah, t- t- and we were we, th- th- none of my colleagues 
bless them, and I feel awful. None of them are doing it. I was speaking to a DI the other day who's saying he can barely scrape enough money to take his kids to Butlins, and it is an outrage, mate. It, you know, I, 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 it's wrong, and, and we all know that, and, and this isn't about... I feel almost bad. I'm not gloating, but what I'm saying is without the business, we we would be going camping again because things have got so bad now with the cost of living. What the business has done is it's freed up financial freedom for us. And like I said to you at the beginning, I'm not at the moment, I'm not desperate to get out of the job. I'm relatively happy in a job. I really enjoy being a police officer again, which is really refreshing for me, but I'm also conscious that things could change. And I feel like I'm at a point now where I've got two choices. I can either go on a cruise and stay in a job because the job is most of my income at the moment or um, I could just stay in a job and not do the cruise I could go camping and and, and have a bit more time to myself maybe um, in March I start my part-time hours so I am leaving some time from the job I'm, I'm condensing some hours and that will give me what that will give me and it, I just find this crazy is I will have my my regular police income which is guaranteed every month and i can live off that happy days i'll have the ability to work um five days every three weeks during a week on my business which is gonna take us to the next level because it'll free up my time but also i'll only work one day every six days at the weekend so i'll work one sunday every three weeks so i'll also have some really good quality family time because my kids are at school yeah. and I, I kind of feel like i've got this juggling act perfect i've got my job in one ball i've got my business in the other and my family in the other and I, i've got a perfect harmony going i'm juggling really well at the moment mm. If it starts going to shit with the police, then I'm at the point now, I'm probably one client away from being able to say I'm off, see you later, and yeah, just yeah. resigning. And that's that's a fantastic feeling. Yeah. You know, I, I do nothing wrong in, in, in policing, but we never know at the moment with the way PSD is, you know, with WhatsApp groups and and all that stuff. Uh, and, I'm, you know, I'm not casting judgment on it. I think changes need to happen. I understand that, but it's a nice feeling knowing that if that happened to me, then fine, suspend me on full pay and when I'm ready, I'll go. And that's kind of how I see it. That's a really horrible thing to say, mm -hmm. but you know, if that happened, then, then fine. Um, yep. It is what it is. Yep. It's financial freedom. Um, the other thing I'd say is that after doing shifts to success and having that sort of business mind and knowledge, what we now do is we, I look constantly for, for, uh for things um so um one of my plans moving into this year or next year is to actually um i have a friend who's a chef who doesn't earn huge amounts of money he works sort of chefs don't tend to earn a lot and i've been saying to him that why don't we buy a food van together i'll do all of the business and you can do all of the day-to-day -day running because i don't have time for that yeah. so i want to expand my income um through other investments as well and i feel like i have the business knowledge to make that work you know i, I know how to do the branding i know how to figure out what food we're going to sell i can work with him on that i know about accountancy i know how to set the business up i know how to pay myself back the director's loan before we worry about the taxes all this stuff uh, and i wouldn't have even considered it before and the best thing is i now know about grants that i can get to to offset 50 percent of the startup costs i can use the other 50 percent from my business to do that and and that's money that you know that, that, that's mine to use because it's in my business you, you're spot on i think a lot of people don't realize that you know you know i i've i've bought business programs before you know property programs etc and i think a lot of people don't realize like when you invest in something like that it gives you the, the the confidence. It gives you the skill set. It gives you the know how to yeah. not just build one, but build multiple. You know, I'm launching another business this year. You know, I've got the property business shift success and a supplement company that we're launching. It, it builds upon each other. And like you, what you're doing now is like actually, you've got you could have an opportunity to have a completely different business. And more so, and what you said there is absolute confidence. But what everything you said there was like, I can effing do this. Yeah. That wasn't like tiptoe. And you said that with absolute certainty. Yeah, I've got the business knowledge. And I think a lot of people don't realize that when you learn, when you have the know-how, you can go again, again, and again. There's many of our clients who are obviously in their second business as well. Um, so it's just something to think about, you know, to get out. Um, one thing you mentioned as well, which I think a lot of the audience 
would appreciate is that you're doing things the right way in terms of potentially leaving the police in the future or, or giving yourself the choice, should I say, for, you, for yourself. I think a lot of people get panicky, like, right, I'm in the job full time. How the hell do I start a business, right? You are a husband. You have two kids as well. And obviously you were full time when you start shift success in the business. No excuse attitude, no victim mindset, straight in offset a few things and change a few things in your personal life to make it this work you've then generated an income from your business you're right built your confidence build your customer base and then what you've done is essentially scaled back your police income because you've got the business income now but by scaling back your sorry your police time should i say you've gone part-time the police by scaling back your police time you've now been able to increase your business time which means you're going to generate even more income from your business, much more than you would ever work in the police. And now, of course, you know, in the future, you've got that choice to go, do I leave or am I going to be pushed? At least you've got that safety net. You've got an additional stream of income. And I think a lot of people worry um, that they have to leave the job first to actually build a business. That's not the case. The majority of shift success members start their business working full time and then they scale back by going part-time in the job, decreasing their working hours, and then of course giving more time to the business. Would you say that's fair, Darren? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, basically mate, for the last 12 months I don't do any overtime. So at work, if I like if I'm caught on, I will always now claim that as toil, uh, which yeah. is still time and a third, which is the same as the overtime rate, right? So uh, I, at this moment in time, for the next uh, what's that, five, six days, I am a full-time police officer working 40 hours a week plus whatever else I get caught on for, which in honesty, my current team is not like it was in, when I was on Intel. Yeah. Um, we This year, we've done, I, I can't even remember off the top of my head, sort of approaching 10K in sales. Mm-hmm. Um, we are, last year, we had a great year. Um, you know, it's... it's um, I can't remember how much we did last year. It's, it's, it's around about 25K. Yeah. Um, you know, our target was 20 to 30. Um, we, we're growing as a business. So we we are pushing out there. I've got uh, a meeting with a 50 million pound business on Monday that are keen to use us for, for something that we do. It's growing. And the only reason I'm going part-time is to fit more work in because that's my choice. Now I could you know a lot took a couple of my clients are on uh, monthly retainers so that you know that they're, they're they're tied in they're committed with me yeah yep, yep, so yep. I, I could now say uh that's 1600 pound a month and that takes me three or four days right yep. how much overtime do you work in the police to get 1600 pound a month jesus christ a lot and, uh, yeah yeah and then and then uh, on top of that you get taxed on your overtime for police now you do obviously get taxed on your business income and there's other expenses accountants and stuff like that but it's, it's still you can be so much smarter on how you do that yep. so me my wife is a director in the business as well and and we, we're going on a spa day now that is a business meeting because we do plan on talking about things for the business okay. but it also happens to be my birthday and, and you can probably see where i'm going with this and <laughs> um, you know this that is the difference between business and non-business and i still find that yeah. amazing um the, the freedom of choice is massive and even if I was in fully committed to the job and I didn't want to leave, I could still have those two clients. I could earn an extra sixteen hundred pounds a month. Let's say after expenses, fifth. Well, uh, let's say after expenses that works out as twelve hundred pound a month. Mm-hmm. Let's just say four hundred pound of that is towards expenses. Yeah. Twelve hundred pound a month on top of your police income. You know that's you, that's hard to get in the police, and I feel really sorry. The reason I feel sorry for this DI, for example, the one I was talking about with the Butlins thing, is because he's he's a really nice bloke. He's a really good DI. He's bloody brilliant in his job, and he puts all the hours in that the job need him to put in. Um, and it and he, you know, and then, and I, I feel bad saying it, but I almost in the back of my head, I'm thinking. You know, this this year we're we're set to do about 40, 45k, which would put me um minus the business expenses, obviously, probably near about superintendent's wage. Yeah. Um, um when you combine the police income as well. If if I left completely and we, we took on more clients, then that money would come easier. But at the moment, I'm just happy. Like I quite enjoy work at the moment. I'm quite happy to do it. Um and do you know what? If we keep growing as we are, then maybe I won't be a police officer next year. Yeah. It's 
different people have different opinions but I would just say don't be put off if you still enjoy the job because no one's going to make you leave like you don't join shift to success and you will see people on there that hate the job and want to get out like yeah, and yeah. fair play people yeah. have done that like I, 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 people won't mind me name dropping but yeah. you know p- people have done that you, you know you've got Bill you've got Mark they, they wanted to get out and that's yeah. them and fair play to them but there's also people who are quite happy quite content and will generally leave when the time is right purely because they feel like actually do you know what this is right for me um yeah sorry i'll stop i feel like i'm rambling again no 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 you said you said the right things i think that's important though you know when you decide to build a business when you're working in the job it's not about leaving the job it's about giving the freedom of choice to stay in the job or not right you know for me in my situation i got covered in human shit slapped around by an angry detainee with a large penis i was showering myself and i thought I really wish I don't want to go back. And at that point, I didn't have to because I had the business, right? Yeah. If you're enjoying the job, have an additional stream of income might make things better because most people panic about the job when it comes to their finances. How am I going to pay the rent, the kids, the, the fees to, for, the, for uh, uh, child care? Um, it could be the car. It could be to commute, whatever it may be. A lot of police officers are getting impacted financially. However, having a business on the side that's earning you an extra grand net right? Yeah. Make all the difference. It, it will remove a lot of anxiety around finances. Yeah. Yeah, mate, we, we you know, we, we, we've got very little debt nowadays, to be honest. And, and again, that helps. And that is because of the business. So, you know, we, we signed up to shifts to success and this was the whole point, you know, like you said, it cost us three and a half K in, in year one, I think we did about 12 in year two, we've done about 25 and in year three, we're looking at at least 40, to be honest. Um, and that's probably 40 if I keep the hours as they're going to be in March. And that's right. comfortable. That's with me having every weekend off with my kids. So the, the, my police income is going to drop five, four or five grand, I think, because I've condensed hours and dropped hours. So, you know, let's say 35K as that and then 40. So that, that puts me on about 75, let's say minus six grand in expenses. Yeah you know that's that's a hell of a wage and actually if i want my my long-term goal probably is going to be to push the business into six six figures uh multiple six figures to be honest and recruit staff that is probably going to be my long-term goal because i can't see me doing this for the next 22 years Um, job yeah can't can't see me being a police officer for 22 years but but for the next couple of years relatively happy so short of anything changing i'll probably stay put to be honest if if i decide actually i'm going to push it then then i think with with having every hour available for the business we could easily push this to a six-figure business um but do you know what we're we're actually taking on staff at the moment um i kind of like that like what i've come to realize is that bringing people in just helps you scale so so well and it gets better yeah 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 but we'll we're, that's that's for the future but at the moment we're really happy and our, my advice honestly is do you know what like if if you don't want to set up a business and leave the job stop the overtime do your 40 hours uh or if you have to if you have to do it which which we all understand take your toil uh, and, and start a side hustle you know look at other like fire service mate my dad was a fireman growing up they have a cushy little shift pattern i appreciate that but they do window cleaning my brother-in-law is a window cleaner and a fireman my dad was a bricklayer and a fireman you know police officers can do that as well half of our firearms officers they do two days two nights four days off apparently have second business yeah it's just a great idea get yourself a side hustle going but don't make like this is easy for me to say because i appreciate it. It, it is a mental block you've got to pay for it it's not free mm. but don't start here in a battery business go and get some professional advice <laughs> do it properly and set yourself up a business it will pay itself back relatively quickly as long as you put the effort in and don't mess around and, and then when it does the rest of it's your money and actually do you know what we actually didn't pay for shifts to success in the end because we we, we wrote it off through the business yeah yeah, yeah. i think uh, yeah a lot of people forget that um with regards to you know it, it's just i was just hearing you speak then and it's mad to think you've only been in business two years and the experience that you've gained and the confidence you gained and you know, you've been a police officer for many many years and you know i think top whack pc after seven years is about 37k is that right no 43 43 is it okay 
yeah <laughs> so forty three thousand, and you know in approaching your third year you're looking to exceed that and it took you seven years to get them the job um i think there are benefits that i think a lot of people kind of miss which obviously you're now um getting in your opinion and this is something i've always pondered on so i've always, always invested in myself um when you go to do a driving instructor, when you learn to drive, you, you pay for driving instructor. Yeah. When you learn to um, do a particular sport, like golf, theory, I, I've got a golf coach, right? I invest in a golf coach. Or when you look to, I don't know, um, maybe take your kids to dance lessons or gymnastics, you, you invest in something to get an outcome. Why do you think, I've got my own theory, but why do you think people typically don't invest in themselves in terms of, you know learning about money wealth creation business property investment what what do you think stops people do you think i think i think the um i think there's a number of reasons i think the first one is is the feeling that you're in a career you're in a career that you thought would always be your career so why should you invest you shouldn't have to and and i, I kind of agree with that you shouldn't have to but but the reality is different so if if you want to make a change invest in it no matter what that is so i would say if you're going to be that person that doesn't want to start a business for whatever reason, mm -hmm. then pay a LinkedIn coach. And I don't know any, I've got no motivation behind this. I don't think there's any in shifts to success. Pay a LinkedIn coach to sit down, write your CV and go through with you and get you a job. My mates, who's like a director of a marketing firm in London, mm. she, she did it. She spent thousands on it, but she's got a job as head of, in fact, Tommy Hilfiger. Um, she's like one of their marketing directors. Um, I can't remember their, big company's name owned from yeah. you, you know investing mm -hmm. investing in that will, will benefit you moreover but people don't do it because they don't i don't feel like they feel they should have to mm -hmm. um also they uh, like, almost like an entitlement thing do you think yeah, yeah a little bit yeah um that certainly was was me i like you know i thought when I joined the police, this is me now, I'm done. And so that then the thought of investing the three and a half grand at the time was a really hard decision because, you know, what if it fails? What if this, you know, what, there's, there's no guarantees and there isn't, mate, is there, you know, I know there's no guarantee. You, you could join shift to success. If you don't put the effort in, you won't go nowhere. It is that simple. You, you've got to do it, but it will give you the knowledge to do it and do it well. And, and we see it in a group, don't we, where people come in and like, oh my, god that look how well they, like that spirit like oh my god and you're like yeah it, it's really good to see but look um if you don't invest in that do you know what do what i did try try and start a business with no knowledge and see how well you get on and you'll do one or two things you'll either go right i need help which is what i did or you'll go business isn't for me and yeah. uh yeah. and then you'll just continue in the job um yeah the other thing is unfortunately mate and and i hate to say this um there are a lot of um it's hard to find the right um coach there's a lot of coaches out there who are shit coaches to be quite frank yeah. and um shift three and a half grand whatever it is now I, I, I don't know obviously but um it's a lot of money right but it's a lot of money for a reason um the problem is a lot of them charge a lot more than that and they're frankly crap mm -hmm. um so i would say that um you know you're producing this podcast you know i i do what i do and that that's one of many guests that you've had come on that are sort of stories of people on the group uh reviews is a massive one um you know you you've just got to, you've got to do your due diligence like we do it at work all the time right yeah i i think that i think a lot of it comes down to as always like number one is it going to work yeah self self-belief the big yeah. one i also think Oh, there's a lot of scammers out there there's a lot of people generally who like we get it sometimes like we get it from like when we run facebook ads we'll get the odds i don't know if they're a cop or not but mm -hmm. they'll say oh, scam or something like that right For, there's not even a, someone we know it's just a random troll and then i think to myself like we'd be so dumb to target police officers to scam like if have anyone it's like we're not, we're not gonna they're police right it's fucking they do this all the time and i think there's a conception out there where you hear these bad names of people who do rip off people. Um, and I think there's a percep perception about their like, it's like, like cryptocurrency or, or, or Forex. There's that kind of notion that is a danger area because yeah. or like most level marketing is one, most level marketing is another one where a lot of people have this preconception of that's an area that I don't like. And I think 
unfortunately they are there are bad coaches out there you're right and there are bad trainers out there so there are and and unfortunately that's something that you have to decipher but i think what that does is it puts a lot of people off and yeah i understand that um and that's why you should go off reviews and stuff like um yeah i i can't imagine there's not many forces that there's not someone in shifts of success in if that makes sense yeah 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 um and yeah, i think like that, Ireland and germany yeah yeah well uh jamie stenton who's now one of your coaches mm-hmm. um you know he he was a di and dci at one point in in my force and he was a huge huge part of the reason that i signed up because actually having the ability to go to him and go mate you know what's this shift this success like i've got this crazy guy on the phone trying to charge me three and a half grand for it uh, <laughs> he was like no it's good and this is what's doing me and i'm like yeah okay cool so then we come to the day and, and it is yeah. what it is you know i'm just but you know that there's there's i wouldn't imagine there's many forces um where there isn't a shift to success presence in there yeah. and, and unfortunately for the job it's a massive massive problem because the retention of staff at the moment is a huge issue yeah. um and i'm hoping that through things like shifts to success plus a few other things yeah um it will drive change positive change for officers as well because i know it costs one hundred and five thousand pounds for my force to replace an officer um so when you're paying them, you know, on pay freezes and stuff like this, hopefully later down the line for future officers, it might have a good impact because sooner or later they're going to realize we need to keep officers. Yeah, it's so, a false economy. Yeah. It's like you're trying to cut back on like pay freezes and pension changes, but what you're doing is actually a massive churn in the amount of police officers you're losing and that costs £100,000 each time. It's like, you know, it's, it's not a great thing. And also like not only that, but, you know, things to do with mental health suicide rate is very very high divorce rate is very very high amongst police officers it's like it's a false economy it's like if you pay people what the more than you know the, the well what they're worth essentially you're going to actually have more people stay commit they're probably going to do a better job they're going to not want to scoff sick yeah so there's a lot of uh yeah I'm, I'm complete with you on that I, I still i don't i don't actually pay myself from the business a wage at the moment because yeah. I don't need it. Like I've, I've got my full-time police income. So next month probably will because I'm going part-time. Yeah. So I've seen firsthand the effects of like pay freezes and inflation. And I still see it now. Like me and my, like I, what I, I do dip in occasionally if I have to, to, to the business, but generally speaking, we try and live month to month. My wife is a civilian in the police as well. Yeah. Um, it's just, um, I feel so much poorer on my police income um i'm so glad that my kids at a thousand pound a month each are not in childcare that they're in mainstream education so we still uh pay for before and after school clubs um an extortionate amount of money but i just i really genuinely feel for officers out there and we, you know we do have officers in our force i know we do in cambridge using food banks um and uh, unfortunately it's counterproductive because um you know, I don't know if this is true, but I went, we, we sadly lost an officer a few weeks ago and um, I went to get fitted for a tunic for his funeral. And there's all, um, there's all bags, bags and bags and bags of uniform there. And the guy in stores is saying that the DCI was saying to him that we're losing four out of five new officers at £105, £5,000 a time, that there's a massive problem there. And I think a lot of that is just the way policing is going. I think that's ultimately what they'll want, a bit like the army, where you go in, you do your service, then you leave before you become sickness yeah. and all that's it. But I, I also, I also think that it's, uh, I, I think the, like my chief, uh, like at that funeral, I was saying about it, brilliant. Like I really like our chief. I like a lot of our senior management, to be honest. Um, but their hands are just tied behind their back. These decisions come from so oh. much. Yeah, so higher the government. The government, yeah. And they don't give a crap. So when they turn around and say, actually, police officers are going to get a five percent pay rise next year, six percent pay rise, whatever it is, that all that's going to do is come out of the chief's budget. And and this is this is the problem. Then that's going to erode the conditions. So well, it's, I mean, it doesn't even like if you've got inflation at freaking six percent or seven percent, you're getting a pay fri- pay rise of five percent. There's that impact. It's, it's non-negotiable, really. It's like yeah. it doesn't even count. But also, what about the previous years? You you guys didn't get pay rises. You yeah, know? And this, this yeah, this this is the thing that I say to. I was I was working with a friend, 
Um, and he's he's never been in the police. And, and he was saying that he's like, you know, the, the problem is, mate, I can't just give everyone a, a pay rise. And I said, look, actually, do you know what? If my pay rises from 2010 had been in line with inflation, just not above inflation, not below inflation, in line with inflation. But now the country's in crisis on the back end of a pandemic Brexit. I don't I don't know what's caused it, but the Ukraine war, whatever the reason, yep. we're now in crisis, right? Inflation, I think, is a 10.2%. If they then turn and I said, we can only afford to pay you a 5% pay rise, I'd, I'd actually be like, okay, that's fair because inflation will come down. Yep. The problem is when your pay has been reduced slowly and steadily for, for 12 years, it's then very hard to take that hit. Yep. And um, I, I, the other thing I find absolutely fascinating is that I speak to business owners. So I was speaking to a coach that we were filming with the other day. Um, and he was like, oh, how much does a DCI earn? And I'm like, um, about 50, 55 grand a year, I think it is. And he just couldn't believe it. And I'm in my head as a police officer, I'm like, oh, that's a good wage. And he's like, really? And I'm just like, it's just, yeah. But we, we could go on about all those things. But like I said, those problems, they're not forced problems. Like I think the chief would love to give everyone a pay rise. I really genuinely do. Problem. I just don't think they can. And that's the problem. And I feel for the chiefs. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm completely with you. I think I think the, the government, you know, and I've said, I've said this right, the government does not care about you. And the, the people who think that the government cares about them are the same type of people who think strippers find them attractive. Yeah. All right. It, it, the government does not care about you. You are just a number and you'll be thrown under the bus. All right. We all know about politicians and that kind of thing. We won't get political, but it's like, guys, you've, you've, you've got to make that, that choice to say, right, I'm going to be my own hero. I'm not going to rely on the government anymore. And actually I'm going to build my way out like you have. And so many have including myself, because otherwise you're just going to be a puppet all the time like this you know the, you said to me the other day, um i think i saw a post in the, in the shift success group you haven't felt the impact as much nowhere near as much as officers because you've got the second stream of income yeah. and when there's an economy downturn recession rising living costs you just haven't felt it you know your kids get to go to before and after with their with their, their activities you're going on a holiday to a cruise i, I love that right because you kind of envisions actually i'm going to take control i'm going to build an additional stream of income i've not felt the impact as much many others haven't who built that second stream of income so guys yeah. if you're listening please and i'm not talking about joining shift success either join another business training company i'm doing it about yourself think about yourself and get the know-how get the knowledge and um create it because it's important um Darren, just, what kind of yeah just yeah. one last story mate because i'm conscious that this podcast is going to be the longest podcast that you've got <laughs> in god knows how many episodes right so um one of the questions that i didn't answer properly earlier is you said to me what made me go into business right so like i said to you i was on linkedin i applied for these jobs and blah blah blah. one of my really good friends is a guy called matt strafford and he's a wedding singer he was a wedding singer back then he's got a couple of businesses um really good friend of mine and and um when the police were going for austerity and when things were getting harder at work and and things just felt that they were going downhill and i think that's quite natural but i just start starting to sort of like really feel the impact of austerity and stuff yeah what i realized was is that his business is paying less tax than what it was in 2010 because the first thing they did is reduce corporation tax right yeah now I'm, I'm not saying i don't think for one second that the government give a crap about a business owner but mm -hmm. what they understand and it doesn't matter what government is in control is that you have to support small business in order to grow the economy so you yep. will always as a small business owner feel less of a victim um but that being said don't get sick pay don't get all that those other perks right but it just made me realize that whilst i'm going through all these hard times and, and the government is saying we've got no money they're cutting business taxes um they might be going up slightly now i don't know but yeah. it's so much easier to earn money in business once you've got it set up properly yeah um and that you know the, the, like the way you can pay yourself is just unbelievable in comparison it's just like dividends it just blows your mind <laughs> there is dividends like like going out for a round of golf yeah networking that you know meals out bars and stuff like that i mean again everyone listening speak to your accountant me and darren are not saying to do those things but <laughs> there's a lot of uh there's a lot of benefits for sure in, in business and also like things about having your spouse as a shareholder in your company they get dividends and and yeah. so forth a company car i've got an electric a nice electric car that i run through my company and i get massive benefits i, I save myself thousands per year running my car through the company so 
I completely agree with you. Um, but that's that's not free money. That's money we've we've earned. Oh, like course. yeah, yeah. The, the tax benefits are different. Like I, I think sometimes we don't realize that, do we? Like it, it is our money that that we've gone off the back and earned. And yeah. and I think um, yeah, you know we we could go political on this all day, but it's um it's just a tax write off that you as an employee you you don't get, and that's that's the difference. I think it's yeah. it's opened my eyes to how much of my income I was losing to tax, which is basically why I won't do overtime now. A, because it's just not worth my while. And B, um, it's to, yeah, it's not. But I, I got asked by my force to produce some videos. Um, and it just, it did make me realise how out of touch corporately we are. Um, yeah. yeah, like they, they were saying, oh, can you do it for toil? And I'm like, not really. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, I, I, I kind of did agree to help out a little bit, but didn't end up doing it in the end. And it was just, it was like, you know, how long is this going to take you? Because I can only release you for so many hours. And you're like, you want me to create a high quality video and you're already at the early stages saying, is, is this going to be a lot of your toil then? And it, yeah, I think as police officers, we are very good when we go into business because we have so many skills that are so transferable. Um, but um, we are so um, groomed, not groomed even. I don't think it's intentional, but we're so, we think that we can't do anything else. You're indoctrinated, and, you're institutionalised. Yeah, massively. And and we, I see it all the time. Like you say, it doesn't even have to be on shifts of success, but officers going off and doing well. And one of the things that my clients said to me the other day, is like, do you know what I like about you? Because I, I had to travel to go and work with him, right? And I, I left early because I'm like, I don't, I hate being late. And I just hate it. Like, I'll be, I'd rather leave early, make the journey, go down and I'll read a book if I'm too early. I'll yeah. read a book and I'll walk in 10, 15 minutes before. And he's like, I love that. You don't, just don't get that normally. And it just made me think, really? Like, that's that's why the client likes me. <laughs> like, obviously, we do good work as well. Yeah. But like, it's that. And that's like a basic skill, I think, of a police officer, a bit of timekeeping. Like mm-hmm. that's such a simple skill. Um, recognizing the fact that I've got an hour and a half to travel from my home address, so I'll leave two hours before because there could be some traffic. It's just mm-hmm. it just that we've got so many skills that you can transfer over. And actually, what led me into the video room, I don't know if you remember this, mate, when we were having this chat, was that um I did a course in Wrighton, which was um a surveillance type course around photography, mm-hmm. and it was just like yep that's it and and yeah we i i would do you know what i'm sure that you wouldn't even mind this i I reckon um between me and you if any police officer listening to this today wants to challenge us i reckon we could at least come up with one viable business for anyone that's that's thinking about it so challenge me and alex drop it into the comments and if you if you if you want to have a chat um with either me or alex sorry alex hope you don't mind this um just just to chat through uh what you could do then go for it we'll do it Or, or someone from your team i'm sure would yeah, yeah, completely. And that's what that's what we do. You know, we, we most people, 90 percent of, of, of police officers come to us without an idea. What I found, though, by just speaking to them, they do have ideas, but they just don't know what makes a good idea. They, you know, demand and checking the market and stuff like that. So they have ideas just by speaking to them and they go, oh, I didn't realize that would be a good idea. And then, of course, when they know they're like, oh, yeah, it makes sense now. It makes sense. It's just the knowledge gap. That's all it is. And I've always said, whatever you don't know can cost you a fortune. Um, and yes. based on what you mentioned about overtime and you'll never do overtime again, you know, um, for everyone wondering, probably, you know, from my perspective, why that is something to keep in mind. What Darren said is that you'll never become rich or you'll never become wealthy or you will never gain the financial sex- success you want if your time is combined with money if you sell hours of your time or minutes of your time for labor you will never become financially independent because it's you're just on this treadmill of you know giving your time to something for something instead what that what darren myself and other business owners at shift success is that we separate time from the equation and what we do is actually price based on value our times are not involved in business. Instead, we price based on value, and that's how we can gain massive traction. So, talk about skill sets. Give me some, you know, three skill sets that you specifically, Darren, as a police officer, have kind of transferred into business. Would you say? Yeah. So the first one is obviously how to use a camera. So I learned that through the job, and that's vital in what I do. 
Um, I, do, you, do you know what, mate? This sounds really stupid as well, but um, like research. So, like you, in my intel role, we used to go out and find stuff. That, that that's generally what we do, right? As police officers, we investigate things. Mm. I didn't have, like, I would now class myself as a professional editor. Like, I edit videos for clients who pay 12, 15 grand a year mm. for, for me to do that, right? Um, I learned all of that by investigating how to do it myself, by getting onto YouTube, watching videos, and just making the time to, to go out and learn. So, like, those, those basic skills... Um, in fact, we even have editing only clients. We work with a cancer charity in the United States that pay us £350 a day to edit video. Wow. Um, yeah, so like that is an example of just learning a skill using your common sense. And I think as police officers, we're full of common sense. Yeah. Uh, and then the third one, yeah, I think is just like, you know, you, you being um, resilient and, you know, resilience is a massive thing in the police. So, you know, it's... When, I, when I'm filming, one of the things my clients love is that if I charge someone our day rate for filming, which generally is about five, five, five fifty a day, we we generally charge for filming. Yeah. Um, I will say to them, don't worry about how long it takes. Let's get as much filming as we can in so that I've got enough to edit, right? So because obviously time is important to them yeah. and the vast majority of people outside of policing will not want to work over their eight hour day and yeah. actually i've always for the last 14 years i've been quite happy being late off after 12 13 hours so what does it matter if i'm back a little bit later on my day filming and that is something that it's that people like it, it amazed me like to me that's normal but to my clients they're like it's brilliant because now i'm getting more i feel like i'm getting more value but the reality of it is it actually suits me quite a lot as well because it means I've got a meeting for a second day because like you say, we price based on value. So we're not going to charge any more for meeting them for the second day. Yeah. We, we, we sort of sell it. And it is true. It saves them time, which is massively important to them. But actually it saves me traveling down again. And yeah. Yeah. So yeah, they're, 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 do you know what? But there's so many skills there. I think I think police officers generally are really good, hardworking people. And I think that's generally why they do well in business. Yeah, yeah, completely agree, completely agree. Um, what makes you feel inspired, Darren? What makes you feel like your best self or living your best self? Um, I I don't know, really. I think um, I don't really have anyone, like there's people around me that I look at and I think I find that quite inspiring. Um, I think my, my motivation is definitely for my for my kids and my family mm. um the people that I look to as sort of like good examples of where I want to be I hate to say this I don't don't know if I want to say this but like Jamie are one of the coaches on shifts to success he yeah. is a very inspirational person he was my sergeant when I joined as well by the way yeah um, <laughs> and this I hate saying it like but but he's like yeah he's so driven in, and it's so um on the ball and so I don't know and I just I look at people like that and I think oh, that's what I want to be like and you know we know that the results that he's seeing are massive they are massive massive results um so I think I look more for the people around me for inspiration my long-term target I suppose is to have financial freedom yeah um I, I want to, um, which is something that I've sort of learned through Shifts to Success as well, even though it's not necessarily part of it, it's, it's a different thing, but um, I want to diversify my income streams because what you just said about time for money is a problem in my business. Mm -hmm. So if I just sell my time for money, I, I will replace my police income and I will have a better lifestyle, mm -hmm. but I will live very quickly hit my barrier. Yeah, and yeah. I recognize that. And we will take people on to, to overcome that with your help. Yeah. But um, the other thing I want to do is diversify. So that's where the things like the food truck I was talking about come in, uh, using that money to build wealth. So been reading some good books. The, the book I read that started all of this off, uh, which is what my friend Matt told me to read, was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. just, I didn't even read it all, to be honest. It's just that first yeah. major chapter. It was like, shit, what am I doing? <laughs> Do you know what I felt like when I read that book, I was like, who the hell effing lied to me about this is the way life should be? <laughs> go to school, go to get good grades, you know, get a mortgage, you know, don't, you know, Monday to Friday, 
who fucking who sold me that? I believed that for so long until I was like 21. That was my life. I was living that. Thankfully, I found out when I was 21. Yeah. But people still believe in that. This indoctrinated thinking. And for yeah. those who don't know, it's like the um the Roth, the Rockefellers. They invented the educational system. They've got a famous quote: "We don't want a world full of thinkers. We want a full world full of uh, workers." And they created the Monday to Friday, two days off. The the, the pension with uh, Henry Ford. It's all a indoctrinated thinking that's been passed down through generations. I'm on my high horse now. You darn, you set me off. Um, <laughs> but this is yeah. It's just I wish people would wake up, like get rid of the slave slave kind of mindset. It is. And and I when I read that book, so the the the, the poor dad. Uh, is a teacher on a really good income um he's like quite high up in the teaching world uh yeah. but he's got he's got credit cards or you know whatever the debt is and and he services yep. his debt and he's always in that rat race they call it and the mm-hmm. the, the rich dad doesn't have as nice of things he you know yep. he, he, he but he invests in assets and that's kind of yep. that's kind of where we're at now that that's the whole point of the food van mate is that do you know what we'll put 20 grand into it if, if it don't work we'll lose 20 grand and that sounds stupid yep. i'd be devastated yep. don't get me wrong but it's 20 grand i don't need to survive it's 20 grand that i can lose and and i don't feel like i'm gambling because like you said i've got the knowledge and the know-how i've also yep. managed to through the, through the work that we do build the have really good connections in that industry which is another reason why i'm going down that route yeah. but um if it does work what we'll have is we'll pay ourselves back the plan is the business plan is to pay ourselves back that 20 grand within the first 12 months whilst paying someone to run it a wage uh, yeah. and then every year we take dividends from that now that is massive because the food vans that we are very in and friendly with and part of the community that will join they generally do just below the or well in fact just below or above the vat threshold so you know if we can make that van produce 60 70 grand profit a year uh because food's got fantastic margins then we divide that by me and the business partner that i go in with that's 35 grand a year which is nearly a police officer's wage being paid out of dividends but instead of paying a police officer rate of tax and paying 8.75 percent tax the way it stands at the moment um yep and and i tell you now that money won't be going into buying a new car because I, I drive a 63 plate ford uh, and i'm yeah. you know I, i've looked at bmws i've looked at them and and i i could put them through the business but but i've restrained myself because i think actually no Let's buy this truck. Let's get this going. Let's get someone running this business for me. And then we'll reinvest the profits from that in another truck and another or or something else. You know, you've got mate, that's, you've got your head screwed on. That's that's amazing. I, I, I think so many people when they start making a bit of money, like yourself, they go, Oh, you know, I can buy this now. I can buy this. Even though you can, you've actually said no. I'm going to think my business mindset, my investment mindset, I'm going to invest to create more money. And also what you said there, you know, about the risk of, you know, potentially 20 grand into a new venture. It's like, well, what's the, it's a risk versus um, cost. It's like, for me, like when I invest in anything, I'm like, well, what's the cost of not getting the success I want? So for you, it's like, well, if you invest 20,000 pounds, the cost potentially, if you don't do it, it's costing you 35 grand plus per year for the next 10 years from the dividend you're going to get. So yeah. the cost isn't the 20 grand. The cost is actually 35 times by 10 years, which is a lot more. Yeah. And um, do you know what, mate? The other thing is, um, I know I know grants are a bit of like a hit and miss thing, but we, we there's a, a thing now, us, and this is what we go back to with the government, right? Uh, the, the van is going to cost me 40 grand. But yeah. because I've got a business plan, because I understand business and how it works, I'm going to go for a government grant which I will yep. never have to pay back, which is a full on grant. And I could, well, I can actually get 18 grand, 50% of the cost of the startup. And that is like the government going, well, you're one day you're going to create jobs. So there's a load of money to help you create those jobs. Thanks very much. Whilst in my main job, I'm, I feel like I'm being screwed left, right and centre. But I'm so... <laughs> it's just it's just beyond me like they, they, yeah. they're going to give me 18 grand to get this going and then it's going to pay me shit loads of money and that's ultimately what i want so it, there is a risk because I'll, I'll also invest the 18 to get to where we need to do for the van but yeah it's just um yeah and you're right like you know right. how much money could that earn and if we don't do it how much money could we lose and this yeah. is the but I did go mental. I'll be honest. I'm talking to you now on an iMac Pro. I've got, yeah. um, if for those of you watching, I've got like a podcast arm. I've got 
um like you know i've got that cruise that i was thinking about like, that's your craft that's your that's your, that's your yeah. craft right you need that's your tools i don't need so... a cruise <laughs> <laughs> okay. no, you but, don't need a cruise yeah I, 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 I do believe there has to be like there's a fine balance right like i do this for a reason like and and for me family time is my reason my family, yeah yeah so um and, and and i've spent a lot of money on the business i've spent a lot of money yeah. on the business but again this grant you know we, we yeah. got a to be honest, and that bought a lot of our equipment. One of my mates, also a police officer who's not on shifts of success, um, has got a grant. He also does like drone stuff, and he yeah. got himself an eleven thousand pound drone. Um, at the time, they were paying eighty percent of that cost. You know, yeah, it's yeah. it's things like this where you're like, you know, it is one sided. The government want to support business because one day those businesses will create jobs and they will create wealth to pump back into the system exactly and then you ask yourself are they there to support police officers and for me it's a resounding no um darren literally i could make i feel like going for a pint with you somewhere i, feel, I could speak <laughs> to you for hours um i want to wrap up the, the podcast but i want to ask you first well where can people find out about your business what's your website what's your social media yeah so um for my business mate i'll be honest we're not massive on social media we we, we showcase some of our work on there um, yep. but my website is motionsprofit.com uh, to yep. not to um yeah and my email address if anyone wants to speak to us about video is just inquiries at motion to profit.com amazing stuff and the last question which we always ask to everyone darren um is for you personally what does entrepreneurship mean to you yeah i think it goes back to that so for me personally it's about two things opportunity and freedom uh freedom financially um and opportunity that everything I look at now, I just see potential, potential. Um, you know, this food van thing come about because my mate said to me, oh, my husband's uh, my husband's hockey club are struggling to get a caterer come in. And I was like, oh, is this a common problem then? And then a few other people I spoke to were like, yeah, we can't get caterers anywhere. And I thought, oh, I need to get a food van. And then spoke to a couple of mates who got food vans. And But years ago, I wouldn't have done that because I never would have had the confidence to do it. So being an entrepreneur is about seeing the opportunity and making it work, you know, and understanding what's not going to work as well, more importantly. Uh, and freedom, because once you've got a business that's running and producing you money, it doesn't make you happy money doesn't make you happy but it makes the world a much easier place and actually being able to say i'm not working weekends thanks very much i want to spend it with my kids is really important to me uh, darren absolutely love that and um i can't completely agree i think money is the vehicle to give you the freedom of choice and it's the freedom of choice that creates the happiness it's the, yeah. it's the, tool, it's the tool for you to get that so i'm completely agree um darren like i said i could talk to you for absolutely hours and hours and hours um thank you so much for joining the show um i got so much out of it um really interesting to hear your thoughts on videoing and um podcasting as well um really trying to say as well that i'm really really proud of you and, and what you've achieved and um, from going from the hearing aid idea with the battery <laughs> to the ups and downs in in the business journey um you're absolutely smashing it mate and, and genuinely i'm really really proud of you you've uh and I just say you've got the attitude, you've got the right mindset, no excuses. Um, you're, fa you're a father, you're a husband, and um, I just know that your business is going to be a, an even bigger success in the future. So, so thank you for your inspiration and, and thank you for being you and uh, yeah, leaning into our process. Nice one. Cheers, Alex. Thanks for having me on, mate. Really appreciate it. No worries.